people here tonight as well from both North Muskegon and Whitehall High Schools. Anybody from Montague High School here? Great, great. Thank you, students. Well, let me begin by introducing our panel tonight. Our format is they're each going to speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, and uh, then we'll take questions afterwards. After all three are done, they're each going to tell you about their specialties and some points they want to make about what's up with our H2O. To start, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ashley Elgin. She works at our NOAA office. Yeah. Ashley? Um, she's been studying aquatic invasive species for quite a spell, actually 15 years. Her beautiful daughter with Eric is May, and she's right here, little two-year-old. Um, she's a benthic ecologist, benthic referring to the bottom of a body of water. She studies the uh, environment of the Great Lakes, which supports a diversity of organisms, but we've got mussels, as you know, and uh, they've been increasing in mass in our lakes, and she's going to be able to speak about our Great Lakes. She uh, maintains a long-term monitoring, monitoring program and conducts field and lab experiments to better understand invasive mussel populations and impacts. Michigan Tech bachelor's, master's from Smith College in marine biology, PhD, University of Notre Dame in aquatic ecology, and a postdoctoral fellowship at the U of M. This lady is talented, and she's in our community and lives in Montague and works at NOAA. Let's welcome Dr. Ashley Elgin. Her great-great-grandfather was a schooner captain. Uh, she's always lived within 50 miles of all five Great Lakes. And besides being a schooner captain, he was a lighthouse keeper on Lake Michigan in the Grand Traverse Lighthouse. And her great-grandfather on the other side of the family was a coal passer and fireman on Great Lakes freighters. Yep. Pretty fascinating. Yep, so we're going to let her have her 10 or 12 minutes, and, and maybe since you've got to take May home, we'll uh, have a few questions, questions yeah. for you, and then we'll move into uh, Eric and to Kathy. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank, thanks, John, for that introduction. So my roots run deep, I guess, in the Great Lakes. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be in the position I am with um, research scientists with NOAA. Um, I'll be, I'm going to try to scoot through my presentation and kind of skip some things to leave more time for questions. But I do want to let you know kind of where I come from, what I think about. So I'm an aquatic ecologist. I study what lives in the water. But um, I started out studying green crab in the Gulf of Maine. I studied, this is uh, invasive species is the common theme to all my research. I studied, this is a Louisiana crayfish, but I took this picture in China because they're invasive over in China. I studied for my PhD the rusty crayfish, which is invasive through all of upper Midwest lakes and even uh, in other places in the U.S. But now in my position with NOAA, I get to ride on the big ships. I get to now study a little thing using big ships. So I study the quagga mussel as shown here. I'll tell you a bit about that today. But in general, I just want to talk to you about invasive species and other things that, that are resources that NOAA has. So NOAA's mission is to, uh, we want to understand and predict changes in weather, climate, oceans, and coasts. We're in the Department of Commerce, and that's because we do research that protects transportation, human lives, infrastructure and commerce. Um, to hear another part of our mission, share knowledge and information with others. So I'm really happy for this event because it helps me fulfill that part of my job. And then we conserve and manage coastal and marine resources. And that's largely the focus of the GLURL lab, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, based in Ann Arbor. And then we have a field station here. Today I'm going to um, talk on invasive species water levels, and harmful algal blooms. Those are areas that we have a lot of active research. I'll touch on them in some brief remarks, and then hopefully if you have questions, I can help address those areas. We do other things as well, but we just don't have enough hours in this evening to go over it. So invasive species in the Great Lakes region, I put up two of the nastiest invasive species we have. What is this? Lamprey. Lamprey. Lamprey doing the terrible things to, you know, it tanked the lake trout populations until we figured out a way to control them. It requires annual control across the whole basin, but this is one of the success stories of controlling an invasive species. And then down below, what is this? 
zebra or quaggas? Or? Yeah, so these are quaggas. I pulled this rock up from about 200 feet deep, or sorry, yeah, 200 uh, feet deep in Lake Michigan. You probably more likely see them stuck on your docks, stuck on props, stuff like this. So someone said quagga, some said zebra. If one thing I can teach you today is that zebras came first, zebras were known first, but quaggas are a much bigger problem in the Great Lakes than zebras ever were. Um, so I'll say, just in general, if you're looking at zebra versus quagga, quagga wins. Um, even though zebras come in first and they spread faster, you rarely find them offshore in the lakes anymore. Um, zebras are more common in inland lakes and, and near shore and on docks and stuff like that, so you're probably more likely to see zebras. Um, they do coexist in some areas, like um, where it's shallow and highly productive. So that would be Saginaw Bay, Green Bay, Western Lake Erie. So here's a picture I took in Lake Erie. It's quaggas on top of a zebra mussel on top of a quagga mussel. So they very much live together and they're, they're like cousins. They're very closely related. Here's some really awesome survey data that we have, this whole lake survey that we've been doing for several decades. You can see zebras came in and this is when they got on everyone's radar. Zebra mussels, they're a huge problem. They were around the lake by 2000. But 2005, they're kind of waning a bit. Well, that's because quaggas came in in the north. By 2005, they really ringed the lake. 2010, you found that they can go deep. They go deeper than zebras can go. We haven't found zebras in our offshore survey in, um, in the last, it's been 10 years since we found a zebra mussel. And look at what quaggas do. So you compare, this is what zebras did, and this is what quaggas can do on a lake-wide scale. So they're a big deal. So if there's one thing I can teach you, quagga mussels are the problem they cause. They've changed the character of the lake. So that, that's the bigger concern in the Great Lakes. <coughs> okay, now it's talking about invasive species in general, thinking more what's happening in our, in our watershed. Um, the reference point here is the Pure Marquette and the, the white watershed. How many invasive species total do you think we have? Non-native species. Any guesses? For, 36. Forget those numbers are there. There's, that's only some of them. One of the notes. Mental, take those numbers off. Yep. It's 51. And a lot of them are plant species. But then we also have fish species. Now, I use this term non-native. You can have something that's non-native. It's from another area, assisted here, um, arrived here by human activity. But it's, we only consider it invasive if it's causing a lot of problems. So this, what do we have here? A Pacific salmon. So we have salmon. These are intentionally introduced, but pr bring benefit. So we consider these non-native, but they're not invasive, generally. <laughs> so, and, but these are invasive alewife because those cause more of a problem. Um, to show the diversity, we also have um, six species of mollusks and other invertebrates, such as this spiny water flea that's shown here. And going down algae all the way down to even one bacteria is a fish disease. So these are what we have just in our watershed. So uh, that's, that's all I'm going to say, kind of lead in about invasive species, non-native species. And I, I look forward to further questions on that if you have them. I now want to make some brief remarks on harmful, harmful algal blooms. This is an area of rich research at the NOAA lab, as well as other labs and universities in the region. So what causes them? Simply put, you have a blue-green algal bloom. So this is a cyanobacteria, blue-green algae. They can grow very fast. They, have, they make huge blooms, and when they produce toxins, then it's a harmful algal bloom. So why do they produce toxins? When they have warm temperatures, when they have plentiful nutrients, when you have calm conditions, all of that is kind of ripe for producing a bloom. But there's still the question mark, the and. A lot of active research right now trying to figure out why do they actually produce toxins. You can have a, a, a species, it's called microcystis, but it doesn't always produce a toxin. But when it does, it produces the microcystin toxin, and that's what shut down uh, Toledo's water, um, drinking water supply was microcystin. So it's, there's still a lot that we have to figure out, but um, it, again, there's a lot of research happening in that area. If you want extra, um, some in, extra information, here's a website you can go to. You could search HABS and GLURL. You'll find your way to this website. And if you see something suspicious, you can contact um, Eagle, Michigan Eagle, and let them know about a suspected harmful algal bloom in your area. If it's green, 
it's not always harmful. You know, we, we've had, I think it was duckweed, that there's a lot of duckweed on the lake, it was last summer. Um, that's not a harmful algal bloom. It might be inconvenient for you, but it's not be harmful. It's not gonna be toxic for anyone. Just annoying. So the last thing I'll comment on is water levels. I, I selected some pictures here. This was 1986. People were having a lot of challenges with water levels. These are pictures from Lake Michigan and properties that were being threatened by high water levels. But we're experiencing it again now. You may be familiar with what happened here locally. You know, here's a home that was, uh, that fell down the bank because of high water levels, high storm activity, eroded the bank and compromised the home. So we, an uh, agency that does, is a really good one to look towards for this is the Army Corps of Engineers. They produce these, um, they have a lot of information and I have, oh, the website didn't show up here, but if you search um, <laughs> Army Corps, Great Lakes, water levels, you will find their resources. And what they produce is these monthly bulletins that tell you this is what the water is and a, si a six month projection of what the water levels will be. And I'm sure this is on the mind of many people here. So I'm gonna just quick orient you to what you see here. This is a running average from 100 years of data showing the annual cycle of water. Water is typically highest in July, then the levels will fall kind of to February, then spring comes and water levels go back up again. So this, again, this blue line is kind of 100 year average. This is what Lake Michigan has been. The red line is where we are now. So you can see since 2018, we were high. Then instead of dropping much at the end of 2018, it, it stayed still fairly high. Of, 2019 was an extremely wet year in Michigan, just all around. A wet spring did this to the water levels. A wet fall, we saw almost no decrease in water levels. So we're at a starting point now to project for the next six months. We're gonna be breaking records as far as what monthly high water for Lake Michigan. Um, because we are, we're projected, we're an inch shy of the record for the month of December. We were just right there at the 1986 records. So that, that's happening again. It's um, largely, this is a lot of um, extra precipitation in that input that increases the amount of water, the ground is saturated, the amount of groundwater, and any water body connected to the Great Lakes will be affected by this. So with that, I'm going to thank my daughter for staying pretty quiet through all of this. It's really helpful. And uh, my husband is, this is the way to introduce him. This is Eric in the picture, and over there, he's gonna be talking next. But I, I do, would like to take this opportunity, if you have any more specific questions about what I